Good to be together this morning. If you, I appreciate the song service this morning so much because I know how much time Matt has put into that and, and worked on that and and has tried to make sure that we have a an opportunity to uh, do everything that we need to do in praise and worship and setting our hearts right with our, the ideas of what we've got and kind of fit it along with the lesson that we're going to have this morning, and, and I appreciate that so much, but, and, and, and that's really talking about having the heart of, like the Father, having the heart of God, or having a heart like God. There's a lot of things that go into that. So as we do that, let's preface it with some, some of God's word. Paul wrote Timothy in, in his first letter to him in the second chapter as we've broken it up. It looks like, it sounds like this. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Does anybody in here know the name of Taylor Storch. Anybody ever heard that name? Taylor Storch is a very familiar name to people who live in Colorado. And the reason was is because when she was 13 years old, this young lady was an active teenager. She was well liked, she had a lot of friends and, and her her parents uh, just doted over her and her brother and sister, and they, they, they loved T Taylor, and, and, and so much so that they made sure that she took care of the things that she needed to take care of by being good examples. Parents were good examples to this young lady. But Taylor Storch's life ended at the, almost before she turned 14. At 13 years old, Taylor Storch passed away. She did so because of a tragic snow skiing accident. Her parents made the difficult and selfless decision to donate Taylor's organs to save the lives of others, and they did. <laughs> See, Taylor's heart medically speaking, was harvested. It was given to be transplanted in someone else. Can you imagine what it would be like to, to know that your 13-year-old daughter heart has no place in her anymore? But it might do somebody else some good. So as they debated about that, they prayed about it, they thought about it, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And like most parents, they, they came to a decision and, and they decided to allow her heart to be taken from her body and donated to somebody who needed a heart. And there was someone who needed a heart. They usually don't like to do that, but somehow somebody found out and told the Storches where Taylor's heart recipient was and who she was and got them the information and sure enough they they met up and the woman who received the gift of Taylor's heart through the transplant welcomed her parents to her home to allow them to listen to their daughter's heartbeat that touched me to listen to the beating heart of their little girl in someone else's body. 
Now, somebody who is cold in nature and selfish more than selfless might say, well, that's just a part. That's not really her. It's not her soul. It's not really her. That's not the point. The point is, is that this young lady's life left her body, but her body continued to be good for something. So much so that now the mother and recipient are good friends. They talk often. I read one interview where Miss Storch was asked, do you still listen to your daughter's heartbeat? And she said, no, not like I did, because now it's become a reality. It's become a finality. It's become a part of her life that I'll never be able to regain. But it was something that was important to her. Herman Melville once made the statement, we cannot live for only ourselves. A thousand fibers connect us with our fellow men. And among those fibers is sympathetic threads. Our actions run as causes. And they come back to us as effects. What is God looking for in a person or a church that he can use in a mighty way? What is it about us in this place that God can use to, to, to further his kingdom? What is it that God is looking for in us individually to make a difference in this community, in this fellowship, in this town, in this world? What is it that he's looking for? Why does it seem that God blesses one person or, or maybe another church is blessed more than another? And when I refer to being blessed, I'm, I'm referring to, I'm not referring to financial or numerical growth or blessing, but to spiritual blessing, an outpouring of God's love. So many times we, we as, a, as congregations, we develop and decide that our worthiness of the kingdom and our greatness in the kingdom is by how many people we have sitting in the pew and how much money we receive in the collection. And that depends and makes up what is successful in a congregation or not. I'm not talking about that at all this morning. Because if we don't get the first part right, it doesn't matter what the second part is. If we don't get the spiritual right, it doesn't matter what the financial or numerical count is we need to be spiritually minded people and the answers I think can be found in my mind as we look at the Bible and especially through the life of David who had been looking over or that we've been, kind of looked over the last several months and, and kind of talked about in and out but David began as the shepherd boy of one of eight sons and yet he was handpicked by God to be the king of his people. He was one of the most successful kings in the history of the people of Israel. And we can read about him, but God used David in a, in a very mighty way. Not only did David experience great blessings as king, but as the people of Israel and as a man of Israel, the people following David as king also experienced those blessings. According to the Bible, there was one thing which David set apart from everyone else, and that was his heart. When the prophet Samuel was sent by God to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king, he was impressed by the, the features of David's brothers. But notice this, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God was looking at David's heart. It was the reason that God had, had chosen him. It was not his physical stability or strengths, his, his might. It was 
not his finesse, it was not his good looks, the strength in his muscles. It was looking at his heart. God's greatest qualification wasn't his intelligence or his skills. It was his heart. His heartbeat was in sync with God's. Whatever God cared about, David cared about. Whatever God loved, David loved. But what God wanted to see accomplished is what David accomplished. Now, he didn't do it perfectly. We know that. We know the story of David. David had problems. But see, the kind of people that God is looking for, for to use in a mighty way, the kind of people that God's blessings are bestowed upon are the people who are after God's heart. People who want inside of them, in their spiritual lives, the beating of God's heart. Because God works powerfully in the lives of the people and in the churches who have a heart for him. I mean, think about this for a moment. What does it mean? What does it mean to be a person who is after God's own heart? A person after God's heart is someone who is obedient. A person who's obedient in everything and does God's will in all matters. In other words, the first priority of being a person who has the heart for God is to do everything God wants us to do to carry out God's will. Jesus said it this way, if you love me, keep my commandments do we love him then we'll keep his commandments and if we're keeping his commandments the world sees us as people who love God God says to us if you want to be after me and after my heart then do what I say to do follow in my footsteps I mean the first we hear of David being a man after God's own heart is during his predecessor Saul's reign Saul was the king. The prophet Samuel had apparently told Saul to wait seven days uh, for his arrival to offer the sacrifice to the Lord and, 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 and to give his blessings before giving, going off to battle, but Saul waited. He dated one day, he waited two days, he waited three days, and meanwhile, the enemy, the Philistines, had a, amassed a huge army of soldiers and chariots, and they were ready for battle with Every day, the terrified Israelite army became smaller and smaller because some of them looked up and said, we can't do this. Adios, we're leaving. We're gone. Vamanos, get out of here. See you later. I'm gone. I don't want to, I don't want to die. This is too overwhelming for me to understand. So Saul decided after the seven days went by and no Samuel, he couldn't wait any longer. He couldn't wait because, for Samuel because otherwise he wouldn't have enough soldiers to fight the battle. So he chose to go after, offer the ritual sacrifice to God by himself. He didn't wait. He went by himself. And just as Saul finished the sacrifice, guess who showed up? Yeah, that's right. Samuel did. And what did Samuel say? Well, he said, I'm not happy. Sammy wasn't happy because Saul had violated a direct order by going ahead without him. And on top of that, God had specifically ordered by direct order, by going ahead without him, Saul violated that direct order. And on top of that, God had specific ways in which to offer sacrifices and they were, they were only to be done by priests and no one else. So in Saul's impatience, so in Saul's impatience, listen to me. So in Saul's impatience, he disobeyed God's command. And what was Saul's response? Well, the Lou Living Translation says it this way. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have disobeyed the command of the Lord your God. Had you obeyed, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever but now your dynasty must end for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart 
The Lord has already chosen him to be king over his people for you have not obeyed the Lord's command. The reason God took away the kingdom of Saul's descent from Saul's descendants was because of what Saul did to disobey God's commands. Saul didn't do what God wanted him to do. The kind of king God was looking for was a person who had the heart of God beating with inside of him. In other words, one who would obey God's command, a person, a person like David. Hundreds of years later after Jesus, another guy named Saul, also known as Paul, taught about what it was that separated Saul from David whenever he talked in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. After removing Saul, he, God, made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Having the heart of God means that we obey everything God tells us to do or we do everything God wants us to do, not just the commandments that are convenient for us. I like the way one man put it. He said, it's not like going to Furs and say, yeah, I'll take that and I'll take that. I don't want that and I'll take this and, I'll take that, and I don't want that. That's not what God wants. God says, hey, look, I got this for you. Somebody asked me one time, is there ever a time when obesity is okay? And I said, you bet you. And they said, really? I said, yes, when we're obese on the word of God. Because it'll make us full. It'll fill us up. Folks, we've got to come to an understanding that God will not use a person and God will not use a church in a powerful way without letting without them following his commands in all areas of their lives. You cannot experience great blessing from God if you do not obey God in every area of your life. If sin persists, God cannot bless. This is not to say that we'll be perfect because we're not. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that as a lifestyle, what we want to do is what God wants us to do. That really what inside of our heart, we want to do what God wants us to do. We don't always do it. I know that. God knows that. We're going to be tempted. He was tempted in every way that we are. He knows what that temptation is like. He knows we're human. He knows we're going to give into it. He knows we're going to make mistakes. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about perfection. He's talking about being able to say, I see the heart of this individual and I see that what they want to do is to follow me they're my child not even David was perfect and yet God said that he was a man after his own heart now we may say we're a Christian which is great but are you after God's heart are you looking forward to being a part of God so much so that you have God's heart beating within you? Does your heart beat in sync with God's? Does your care encompass the care that God cares about? Do you care about his commands? Do you care that God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth? Do we really care about those things? Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 4 that he, he wants all people to know the truth and have a relationship with God. He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Every person, not just the nice people, not just the people who would make good Christians. I love that line, don't you? Boy, if we could just get them converted, they'd make good Christians. They're good people. I'm glad somebody didn't think that about me. I'm the antithesis or was the antithesis of good person. And it took God moving in my life and moving in my family's life for me to come to God and hopefully, I thought, find a way to him. And he opened the door and now I don't have to say hopefully anymore. 
because I am somebody. I am somebody. I count because I am God's child. And that counts for more than anything else that I'll ever be. I am God's child because my God doesn't make junk. His heart beats within me because I know that I beat inside of his heart because of what he's promised to do for me. God cares about people who are mistreated, abused, and treated unjustly. In Psalms 19, 14, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our prayer needs to be that prayer. Our prayer needs to be that prayer. We need to be going after God's heart as a priority so that we can experience the blessing of God. But David wasn't just satisfied with doing things for God to please him. David actually wanted more of God in his life because David had a passion for God. It was something that just didn't you know, show up. It wasn't just something he did. It was something that was there. He had that passion. People who have a heart for God have a desire for more of God in their life. Not just that they have him, but they want more. They're searching for more. Just as you hunger for food and thirst for water, those with the heart of God have a soul that hungers and thirsts for God. David wrote in Psalm 63, verse 1, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. <clears throat> I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You know when he wrote this? When he was running away from Saul who wanted to kill him? David's heart didn't just beat along with God's heart. His heart beat for God. As we sang earlier from Psalms 42, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. Do we even think about that when we sing it? Does our soul long for God? You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I can't wait to worship you. When the Ark of the Covenant, the box of God instructed the Israelites to create, to be placed where the in the Holy of Holies where the manifest presence of God dwelt, as it was being brought back into Jerusalem after it had been captured again and recaptured for the first time, David danced with joy. The people were shouting and singing and excited because of the presence of the Lord was entering Jerusalem. Would we say that we're people? Let me just ask you, would, would you say that the West Freeway congregation is a people of passion for God. As you sit in your seat this morning individually, are you a person with a passion for God? Do you really have him in your life passionately? I've seen people with a passion for a lot of things. But rarely have I seen people with a passion for God. I've seen passion for sports, and boy, could we go on with that one. We can spend a couple hours at sporting events, perhaps even in bad weather, but an hour or more in worship on Sunday morning, we've got to be home by noon. We spent way too much time in church. And I'm going to tell you something, there's a difference between church and worship. Church is where you go just because you have to. Worship is where you come to praise and thank God for what he's done for you in your past and what he can do and will do in your future. We need to get that changed in our mind. We need to get some rewiring done because I think what we've done is we've settled for a good enough mentality. We've settled for that's good enough. My relationship with God's good enough. It hadn't got, it's gotten me this far. And so we're satisfied with the status quo. Unfortunately, it tends to take 
on the air of a tragedy, major life transition or stressful time in our life. And it takes those types of things before we realize how inadequate our faith is. Some of us just say getting excited about religion is not in my personality. Then you've got the wrong personality. Don't have to get excited to be a child of God. How can you be excited by not, how can you not be excited by being a child of God? David wasn't afraid of his emotions. Whenever he saw the beautiful things of God, he danced with passion and joy in his life. How are we doing? A person with a heart for God isn't satisfied with the status quo. They desire more of God in their life. They actively engage in doing the things God loves. And God honors and blesses a person or a church who honestly desires after God's heart and desire more of him. So the question, how do we become more like that? How do we become a person after God's own heart? How do we become more like David, a person after God's heart? I mean, it sounds nice and perhaps we think, I would like to chase after God's heart, but I don't feel it. Or my heart's not into it. Look at Psalm, uh, Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. In our culture, we have a misunderstanding about what the heart is all about. We think of the heart as being the place of emotions. We say, I love you with all of my heart. The heart is where I feel. But the Old Testament, the heart was not just the place of emotion. The heart was also the center of thought and will. Today, it would be more accurate if we called it the heart and mind. Guard your heart, guard your mind, and everything you do, do flows from it. We think the heart can only be changed by a whim. Our decisions allow us the opportunity where we can make a choice to have a heart of God or not. It becomes whatever it is that we make it. Pursue God's heart until you feel it. Pursue God's heart, and once you feel it, pursue God even more. It isn't about doing it when the mood strikes you. Or some say, I don't feel a love for God. It's about what I choose to do. Will I obey God in all matters? Will I pursue God? Will I praise God even if I don't feel like it? Well, let me ask you a question. Will you obey God in all matters? Ask yourself this question. Will I obey God in all matters? Will I pursue God? Will I praise God even if I don't feel like it? I don't know. And I think the answer is one that you're going to have to make. You're going to have to ask yourself, if God was to listen to your heart, would he hear his own beating? If God was to listen to your heart this morning, would he listen and hear his own heart beating? Do you have the heart of God beating within you? I hope that you do because it's very important. We need to have a heart like the Father. A heart that will completely pull us away from this earth a heart that is based on the things above not on things below this morning if you don't have the heart of God then we're going to sing an invitation song to give you that opportunity to change your life to be who you need to be and if you need this morning to change your heart don't wait the easiest thing to do is to stand up and say, I'm ready. The hardest thing to do is to sit there and do nothing. Because see, inside of us we know 
we really want to do what's right. Deep down inside of us, we know that that's really where we want to be. So this morning, take the easy road. Say, I want to do what God wants me to do. I had a lady get upset with me one time. She said, you know what I don't like about you? And I was dumb enough and young enough to say, no, what? She says, you think it's going to be easy to go to heaven? I said, I do, and I'm sorry if you don't. I think it's easy to go to heaven. It's a choice. It's a simple yes or no. I'm either going to be with God or I'm not. I hope I touched your heart because God touched mine and I hope he's touched yours. Taylor Storch's heart is beating still today. Her mother can hear her heart beating in another person's body and we get emotional about that. We think that is really, really neat. But if God listened to our heart this morning, would he hear his? If not, change your heart. Let it beat with God. And if we can help you in any way, our shepherds are going to pass. Grab one of them, speak to them, meet them in the back, They'll go in the library with you, visit with you. If we can help you down front in any way, we'll be here to re greet you here. Fill out one of the yellow cards, a prayer card. If you need to have prayer, pass the aisle. They'll pick it up. They'll pray about that. But don't leave God's heart outside your body. If you need to come, do so now while we